This uh, here is, is a Brodsky lecture. We go to Ansky from Princeton. Uh, we'll be delivering uh, three lectures, starting with this one. This uh, lecture will be about uh, self-similarity, two examples of singularity formation. All right. Um, thank you, Jack. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. So, um, right, good joke. So the three lectures, a um, little bit reversed in order. I think the most elementary one is going to be the third lecture. It will be basically content-free. I'll just show you some pictures, and that will be that, more or less. Uh, the first two lectures maybe have slightly more content, but not by a lot. So, <laughs> so this should be relaxing. Um, all right. So. Um, Please don't hesitate to, to, to ask any questions if you want me to explain something better. I noticed the first two lectures are self-similar. Exactly. They get the same title. Exactly. That's intentional. So they get the same similar. That's, that's very much intentional. Right. OK. So, so the, this talk is not intended to be a survey, a sort of a, or a broad sweep of what similarity is, or self-similarity is, and uh, how it applies to, to a general theory of PDEs. I just want to show you, just want to give you a vague concept of what similarity is, what self-similarity is, and show you two examples. Okay. So, all right. so let me start with the notion of similarity. So first, something very abstract, or somewhat abstract. So similarity in PDEs is simply an action of R plus, action on the modular space of solutions. Your favorite PD. Okay. <laughs> there is no PD yet, so there is no boundary condition yet. So this is just that there is some PD. There is a moduli space of its solutions, and I imagine that there are plus somehow acts on that space of solutions. So let me be a little bit more specific. So this action is supposed to preserve the PD. So it preserves the PD. And it maps a solution into a solution of that PD. Okay. Let me give you an example. So the simplest example, or one of the simplest examples, let's look at the Laplace equation. Laplace V is equal to zero. Let's imagine that x is an RM. So it's very easy to write down a similarity transformation which acts on the space of solutions of this PD. There are no boundary condition. I don't want to talk about boundary conditions here. So what's the action? So I'm just simply going to take a solution phi of x and map it into a solution, which is phi of lambda x, okay. where lambda belongs to R plus. So that's the group that acts on the space of solutions. Very easy to check that, indeed, this maps solutions into solutions. Now, this, of course, has something to do with the corresponding underlying symmetry of Rn. That's why it maps solutions into solutions. That's why it preserves this PD. All right, now for the purposes of these two lectures, actually, I don't want to talk about this kind of PDEs. I want to talk about slightly different type of PDEs. I want to talk about evolutionary PDEs. Okay? So, so, evolutionary. And the only difference, really, is that instead of just having a variable x, I imagine that I have variables t and x where t belongs to R, and x belongs to, well, Rn, or maybe something else. Okay. So let me give you, by the way, let me just give you a quick plan of what I'm going to do. So basically, the first talk, it's all going to be about x and Rn. And uh, so the second talk is going to be a little bit more geometric. That's actually going to be an, an, about x and Rn and T and R. 
And in the second talk, it's going to be about T and X, which belong to a four-dimensional Lorentzian manifold M. So, uh, and the notion of similarity and self-similarity will be different. The first talk will be basically non-geometric and the second talk will be um, much more geometric. So I'll, then in the second talk, I'll give you a correct geometric definition notion, uh, notion of uh, similarity and self-similarity. But for the time being, just think of T and R and X and R. Okay, so, um, well, what is, it, what is an example of an evolutionary PD? Well, replace, replace Laplace by box. And where box is simply dt squared minus Laplace itself. Okay, and of course, since it's an evolutionary PDE, typically you think of the problem where the initial data t is given. So let's say at time t equals zero, you have you give yourself the initial data t naught, and also this being a second order PDE, you have to prescribe the time derivative. Yeah, this. This will not be important too much, but let's just think of this. Okay, so um, what is a similarity transformation? In general, for an evolutionary PD, so you can think that I'm going to take not necessarily this one, but a general one. So let's say that you have a solution of an evolutionary PD, which depends on both T and X, and I want to rescale it and map it to a solution, to a different solution of the same PD. So a general transformation of that kind will basically take the following form. It will be one over lambda to the power alpha. Phi, I'm going to rescale the variable t by lambda to the power beta. And I'm going to rescale the, the variable x by lambda to the power gamma. So there are three parameters here. Alpha, beta, and gamma. Well, one thing is that simply by relabeling the definition or renaming what lambda is, it's clear that you can simply take beta equals one. You can choose beta equals one. And so that leaves us with two parameters, alpha and gamma. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Right, exactly. So for linear equations, the rescaling of the amplitude is almost free. So alpha is a free parameter. And that's actually a very interesting point that already in this case, of course I could have done this in this case as well. You see that this is not just an action of R plus, it's an action of a slightly larger group. It's R plus times R plus. And that will be important. So in fact, in general, a priori, you can have an action of R plus times R plus. If PDE is linear, then the parameter alpha is completely free. And all you need to worry about is the parameter gamma. So let's see what the parameter gamma is, for instance, for the wave equation. So for the wave equation, gamma, it's very easy to see that gamma is equal to one for the wave equation. If instead of the wave equation, you consider the heat equation. So for the heat equation would be dt of phi minus Laplace phi is equal to zero. Instead of the second time derivative, you see first time derivative. Then in this case, the space has dimension two compared to the uh, dimension of time, which is one. So in this case, gamma would be equal to one half. Okay. So this is so far, so far, so good. Okay, so these are linear examples. And this is similarity transformations. Now let's talk about self-similarity. So what is self-similarity? Well, self-similarity is simply a fixed point of this action. So we have an action. Again, I've given you linear examples. You will see non-linear examples in a second. But imagine that just you have an abstract action of R plus on the space of the modular space of solutions. What I want to do is that I want to find fixed points of that action. So fixed points. Well, it turns out that it's not very difficult in the sense that we can look at the similarity trans transformation, general simu 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 similarity transformation that I've written down here. And from this, I can deduce 
what self-similar solution should look like, what a fixed point is. And this deduction is very simple. So a fixed point P T X will simply be equal to 1 over T to the power alpha, some function capital phi, which is now X T to the power alpha. What's the important point here? The important point is that when you look for fixed points, you, have, you can reduce a dimension. So in a sense that we started with a function phi, which was a solution of our PDE, which is a function of two variables, t and x. And we ended up with finding that this, a fixed point of this action is actually a function which effectively depends only on one variable. That variable is, so the important thing here is the profile phi of y where y is x over t to the top. And what does profile solve? So this is called the profile, which determines our self-similar solution. And it turns out that while we started with an evolutionary PDE, this profile solves instead an elliptic equation. And I'm putting it in quotation marks because, well, it's vaguely elliptic. Okay. So let me show you a couple of examples now. So let's raise the stakes. Now, rather than look, uh, looking at linear equations, I'm going to look at the nonlinear equations. So for instance, what happens if you take, if you look at the nonlinear heat equation? So here, first of all, the fact that the equation is nonlinear immediately breaks down this action r plus times r plus to just r plus. The parameter alpha is no longer free. Okay. And so then, so here, phi of tx is, so let me write down the law of self-similarity. It turns out that the correct scaling is this. Capital phi x over t to the power of one half. Okay. So everything is fixed. This parameter is fixed by the PDE, and this parameter is fixed as before by the PDE. Okay. And what is the equation? Yeah? Absolutely. So any self-similar solution would have to be, would have to take this form. Now the question, I'm going to try to answer your question by writing down what equation does this capital phi satisfy? And it turns out that this capital phi satisfies this equation. So in the variable y, so again, I'm going to introduce y, which is x to t to the 1 half. And this PD is written in terms of the variable y. And it becomes plus and a phi, oops. I don't want to get the constants wrong here. It's y over 2, gradient of phi. So as, as promised, this is an elliptic equation. There is no statement of uniqueness, and there is no statement of existence in it. So whether self-similar solutions exist or not, and whether they're unique or not, it's a completely different, it's, it's an art. And the point, the only point is that you reduced an evolutionary equation to a non-evolutionary equation, to an elliptic equation. Right? That's the point of this calculation. And now you can ask, 
whether you can find self-similar solutions, whether the, the fixed points of this action exist or not, and whether they're unique or not. Okay. So that's this reduction that by looking at the fixed points, you actually convert an evolutionary equation to an elliptic equation. But the more important question is that why? Why look for fixed points of this action? Why is this action important? What can you use this for? Um, what do you do with self-similar solutions if you find any? What do you say if, for instance, if you don't have any self-similar solutions, how does it help you? So let me try to explain. So the fact that self-similar solutions are important, it's a, that this, this goes back very, very long way. It basically goes back to the 19th century. People have understood that looking for self-similar solutions, it's a very good way of reducing complexity of your equation and then extracting some information. So what information does one extract? Well, let's look at this profile. So this profile has an interesting property. It looks for solutions which, as the name would suggest, look similar on different scales. Okay? And suppose for a second, there are two regimes here that are important. One regime is when t goes to zero, and the second regime is when t goes to infinity. So let's first look at what happens when t goes to zero. So if you, if you find the profile capital phi of one, which is nice, so if capital phi, if you found capital phi, and capital phi is, let's say, smooth, and rapidly decaying. at infinity. So remember, this variable y, you think of it as in Rn. So if you happen to find a profile which is smooth and rapidly decaying, then we can draw the graph or the picture of the self-similar solution which is given by this, by this profile as t goes to 0. And it's very clear what's happening with this solution. So this is t equals 0. And I can simply draw. Imagine that it's not just rapidly decaying, but imagine that it's compactly supported. So at some negative, for instance, you started some negative time t. This is where your initial data was. It was supported at time t equals minus 1. It had compact support, and it was supported here. And then you let the time evolve, and you look at the picture of your solution. And you see that the support shrinks. It shrinks to 0. And Exactly how it shrinks to zero, of course, depends on this parameter gamma. So for instance, in this picture where x, uh, the correct scale is t to the 1 half, you see that the, the shape here is parabolic. Okay? So this is how our profile, the support is shrinking to zero. And what's happening with the amplitude of this function? Well, the amplitude is blowing up. It goes to infinity. <coughs> so what does it mean? It means that if you manage to find a self-similar solution, which is given by the smooth and rapidly decaying profile, then as a result, you found the solution of your evolutionary PDE, which develops a singularity from smooth initial data. Because at time minus one, you had smooth compactly supported initial data. And at time zero, you ended up with something which blew up. In negative times, yeah. So you just put. Absolutely. So, yeah, that can be made sense. Alternatively, so then there is sort of, you, you can write t minus a constant. There is always an additional translation, typically an additional translation symmetry. Um, OK, what about what happens as t goes to infinity? Well, it's clear. It's then, in that case, everything is reversed. Instead of shrinking, support expands. Instead of amplitude going to zero, the amplitude is going to, uh, sorry, instead of amplitude going to infinity, the amplitude is going to zero. So if you reverse this picture, then as time kt goes to infinity, instead, plus infinity, instead you get this picture. So you start with complete support. And then support starts expanding. 
and your solution decays to zero. All right. So now I can tell you what this good, what the solutions are good for, or at least what people thought they might be good for. And it basically goes to two ideas. It goes to the back to the work of Barenblatt. in the 1970s, who suggested that self-similar solutions should provide intermediate asymptotics. as time goes to infinity. So in other words, yeah, exactly. So let me translate what that means. It means that for large times, so you look at the solution, general solution of your evolutionary PDE with general initial data, not self-similar. You let it evolve, you wait long enough, and then what he proposed is that after you wait long enough, the solution will asymptote one of the self-similar solutions, but for long, but not infinite amount of time, because after a while, the behavior may change again. And so that's why the, he introduced this name, intermediate asymptotics, okay? Long enough, but not necessarily as time goes completely to infinity, because this may be a transient behavior, but eventually, but for some period of time, it would be approximated by self-similar solutions. So that was Baron Blatt, but even before him, so, and that has to do with what happens as time becomes large. On the other hand, Zildovich, coming from a completely different direction, so Zildovich in the 60s, introduced the idea that actually self-similar solutions are crucial for understanding singularities. And moreover, Zildovich suggested classification of singularities into first and second type. Let me explain what these are. So, when you say it's important to understand singularity, it means that every type of singularities you get from any solution exactly. can resemble it by a singularity of the self -similar Exactly. Or like exactly. That. Yes. So, his idea was that basically all singularities can be modeled by self similar solutions. And the only thing that you should differentiate among those singularities are what he called the first and second types uh, singularities. What's the difference between first and second type? What are these types? That has to do with this uh, action of the group R plus times R plus that I was talking about. So in this picture, you have two parameters. You have the parameter alpha and you have the parameter gamma. The first type singularities are singularities which arise in PDEs where both parameters are determined by the PDE itself. Like for instance here, we found out that the PDE dictated that gamma is one half and alpha is one over p to the minus one. So both parameters are fixed and the action of the group, of similarity group, is just R plus, nothing else. The second type is the type where one of those, where the group is larger, where it's still R plus times R plus. In other words, where a PDE only fixes one of the parameters and the second parameter is not fixed. Right? And it's still free in your problem. And this is the type, and this was, by the way, this is the motivation why Zildovich was interested in, this, in these questions, and I'm going to come back to this. This, come from, this comes from hydrodynamics. Okay. So let me now put these two pictures together and formulate a conjecture. with a question mark. The conjecture says the following, that self-similar solutions
describe universal behavior in the following sense that they are attractors so that is if your solution blows up in finite time blows up in finite time then the singularity resembles can be approximated a self-similar one so if it blows up then you are attracted to one of the self-similar solutions near the blow up if it exists for all times if instead the solution is global then again as time goes to infinity the solution can be approximated by a self-similar one. Okay. Yep. Yes. So, well, for instance, let's take this case. If you approach the singularity, well, if you, I mean, which, which, which one, which one do you want to see? The second one, the second one right? So, for instance, um, well, I raised it. Okay, so you have this picture. So, for instance, you could say the following: that if your solution exists globally, then you can take, you can find a profile, capital Phi, with the property that if you take a look at the difference of this profile. then you can say that this is capital O or little o of 1 over t to the power 1 over p minus 1 as t goes to infinity. Okay? So after you subtract off the profile, you go to 0 faster than the, this self-similar solution goes. If you solve the heat equation backward in time, yeah. well, you, you, you can't, right? So there's a problem. There's a bigger problem. The solution doesn't blow up. The solution, the equation is not well posed if you reverse the time. So it exists in the right? Yes, but we're only looking at the, so you, you want to look at the solutions forward in time and look at the ones that blow up in finite time. And then you want to say that then they're approximated by self similar solutions. Okay, it's an approximation for the heat equation, it's an approximation forward in time. Yeah. Intermediate. Intermediate. Yeah. Here I'm stating much something much stronger. Yeah. So this is sort of I wanted to. This is a, an argument reductio ad absurdum because I want to tell you that this conjecture is not correct. But I just said that I want to summarize both of these ideas and put them in a the clean form, which might be more digestible but certainly incorrect, because this statement is incorrect as Baranbat already already known that you can't expect this to be universal behavior as time goes to infinity. You might expect this as transient behavior for large times, but you shouldn't expect this to be that universal. And I also should say this is much more subtle, but this is also not entirely correct. Okay. In, that universe, in that generality, yeah. Does it say anything about the distance, the relative of No, right. So for instance, it's a. Exactly. That's a, that's a fantastic question because this would also tell you that if there are no self-similar solutions, then this should not happen. You should not blow up in finite time. Okay. And of course, this is, this is exactly what people want to do. Because what, what you want to do, ideally, you want to start with your PDE and then you want to probe for all kinds of models of singularities. And one of these models, the most important model perhaps, 
is the self-similar solutions. And if you can show that self-similar solutions do not exist, then you want to claim then that the solution, arbitrary solution of your equation, cannot blow up in finite time. It should exist global. It cannot, right? But here it says, if solution blows up in finite time, then it can be approximated by self-similar. And so if you examine the sentence, then the sentence should imply that if self-similar solutions do not exist, then your solution cannot blow up in finite time. And then you go to the second one. Yeah, and the second one is also, right, but by, by what we just said, the second statement is also not correct in the sense that that's not supposed to be a necessarily universal behavior. Okay. So this conjecture is incorrect in this, and it's incorrect in this. However, so it's completely incorrect, completely incorrect as this is concerned, and I, I do not want to speak of this again. So I will not be interested in the behavior, in trying to classify the behavior of your solutions as t goes to infinity. I want to focus on this part. Okay? I want to focus on the idea that somehow self-similar solutions should help you to classify your singularities. And ideally, if this conjecture was right, then any singularity should be a self-similar singularity. And in particular, if you can rule out existence of self-similar solutions, then you would rule out uh, singularities of your PDE. Well, this, this discussion applies to all PDEs. <laughs> Not even just on RN, but all PDEs, because this discussion is so general and so incorrect that it can apply to all PDEs. <laughs> is there a discussion about time or is just one variable? No, no. I mean, it's important that, of course, we're talking about evolutionary PDEs. But it's just pick one variable Yes. Time. Well, yes, yes. In some sense, yes. OK, of course, you have to be more careful because I want to, in reality, the evolutionary PDEs that I, I'm thinking about are of the two types. Either they're sort of the nonlinear nonlinear heat equation type mm -hmm. or nonlinear wave equation type. Okay. But in one spatial dimension or is it T is in one spatial uh, is in one dimension. X, of course, is in multi-dimension. Yeah, multi-dimension. So why is this incorrect? Because there are other types of singularities, sometimes. So um, you mean it, you think it's easy to check? Not necessarily. Actually, no. And I will come back to that. Uh, funny enough. All right. So, so let's summarize this. So this conjecture is not correct. There is one immediate reason why it's incorrect. Is that it does not account for one extra phenomena that can happen is that not only can um, your PDE admit self-similar solutions, but can, it can also admit what's called stationary solutions. So they might be stationary solutions. So for instance, for the heat equation, a stationary solution would be a solution of the type minus Laplace phi plus phi to the P is equal to zero. These are time-independent solutions. Okay. Now, Stationary solutions sort of appear to be harmless because they, they don't change in time. So in particular, the amplitude does not blow up. They don't shrink. They, nothing happens to them. So it seems that they're harmless. But it turns out that in many situations, if you have a stationary solution, it can be highly unstable. And if you perturb it, it will want to collapse. And it will collapse not necessarily with a self-similar type behavior. And that does happen. However, if you now add this plus this, then this conjecture is almost true. At least there are many examples where you can basically say the following. If your PDE has the property that it has neither self-similar solutions nor stationary solutions, then it does not have singularities. Or if it does have singularities, they're mild, you can do surgery, you can continue past them. Okay. 
So one example where this more or less exhausts all the possibilities is Ricci flow in dimension three. Ricci flow in dimension three, uh, the reason why Poincaré conjecture was proven is that you could classify all self-similar solutions, all stationary solutions, you could then make a claim that they more or less exhaust all the model singularity models, and with this singularity models, you can remove them by doing surgery and continue the flow past them. So it's not the case that uh, for the Ricci flow in dimension three, you could show that solution does not blow up in finite time, there are no singularities, it's just that you could classify all singularities via this procedure, and then uh, by, uh, after surgery, remove them and continue. Very good. So all I'm trying to do is to convince you in the importance of looking at uh, for self-similar solutions or at self-similar solutions and trying to understand what happens. That it's not just an isolated phenomena. It's not an example of a singular solution. This is something bigger than that. This is almost universal. OK, so all right. So now it's time to become a little bit more specific. So I just gave you an example. Oh, I told you about the Ricci flow. So more or less, you could say the following, that for geometric parabolic flows, PDEs, so think of nonlinear heat equation, think of Ricci flow. In, this picture holds. If you have singularities, then singularities are going to be are going to resemble either self-similar solutions or somehow stationary solutions. So, in other words, the singularities are self-similar plus what's called bubbling off phenomena. So in other words, as you approach the singularity, you can bubble off, you can rescale, not so similarly, and uh, discover a stationary solution. Okay, that's good. But that's for geometric parabolic PDEs. What happens with, on the other hand, wave or dispersive PDEs? Not understood. Only concrete examples are understood. Only very specific examples are understood. Never universal behavior. You could almost never classify singularities. You could maybe sometimes come up with examples of self-similar singularities or bubbling off singularities. But it's extremely difficult to simply say, if I have a singularity, then it must be of this kind. And what's the difference? Why is there a difference between these two pictures? Well, the difference is that in this type of problems, you typically have monotonicity, which drives the behavior to certain behavior. In these problems, you have oscillations. And when you have oscillations, it's very difficult to show that something is universal. OK. And so now we come to a very specific example that I want to discuss. That's the, the equation that has not appeared so far. And that's the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. I dt phi minus plus phi phi is equal to zero. So. It's difficult to compare <laughs> because, so I'm going to show you a theorem which we now know for the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. We don't know the corresponding theorem for the nonlinear wave equation. So here T and X are in Rn plus one and function phi, it's complex, right? Because there is an R here. So you know, it has to be complex power. Very, very much studied model. So um, one of the important features of this model, OK, so I want to, of course, think of it as an evolution problem. So let's say I pose the initial data at time 0. 
or at some negative time, doesn't matter, um, and then solve this problem for it. One of the important things in this model is that there is a conserved quantity, a quantity which is conserved by evolution, and that's energy. And the energy is very simple here. It's integral over Rn and gradient of t squared plus 2 over t plus 1 phi to the power of t plus 1. Um, sorry, this has to be t minus 1. This is, minus one. And this is integral over, over Rn. So I'm simply saying that you have this. So E remains constant along the evolution. This equation, like the equations before that I shown for you, it has a similarity transformation. So there is something that maps space of solutions into itself. So we can look for self-similar solutions. So let me write the similarity transformation. So here, E dx is mapped into 1 over lambda, 1 over p minus 1, um, p t over lambda, x over squared over lambda. You notice parabolic scaling here. And of course, you notice this is very similar to the heat equation. In fact, it's exactly the same group that acts on the corresponding heat equation. Not surprising, the equation is the same, it's just that i is here instead of d by dt. The important part is that the group here is just R plus. It's not a bigger group, R plus times R plus. It's just R plus. So, okay, so let's record that. So, if we have a solution phi, then we can form a whole family of, a one parameter family of related solutions, which I can call phi lambda. So, let's call this phi lambda. And if I have a conserved quantity, then I can check the behavior of my conserved quantity on this one parameter family of solutions and see how it behaves. Okay? So we can look at the behavior of, of this. And you discover an interesting dichotomy. In fact, it's trichotomy if you want. So this goes to infinity, it stays constant, or it goes to zero depending on p and n. And what's the relation? You have this, you have this, and you have this. As lambda goes to zero. So I want to drive my solution to, sing to something singular. So this as lambda goes to zero. Because as lambda goes to zero, I'm making my solution to concentrate and also uh, make it steeper in amplitude. What's the idea? The idea behind this is that if I have a self-similar solution or if I have a solution which is modeled by a self-similar one, then, well, the energy which is conserved should tell me whether I'm going to be allowed to concentrate like this or not allowed. For instance, you see immediately here that if P is less than this, then the energy going to infinity since the energy is conserved, it tells me that I cannot be concentrating like this. This behavior is prohibited. This is a borderline case. And in this case, well, I could concentrate. The energy is going to zero, so this, the, my energy does not control the fact that I want to concentrate. Okay, so it turns out that this simple test is a very good predictor of what actually happens. So in particular, this behavior of energy tells you that when p is less than n plus 2 over n minus 2, self-similar solutions are impossible. And remember, we discussed in the context of that conjecture that maybe if self-similar solutions are impossible, the, your, you, you will not develop singularities. And this is an example where this is indeed the case. So here, all solutions are global. It turns out that here, the conclusion is also the same, although it's much more difficult to show. And you don't show it by showing that there are no self-similar solutions. You show it by very different methods. So this goes back to 70s and 80s, uh, starting with the work of Ginebra and Velo and other people. This is much more sophisticated. This is the work in the 90s and 2000s, starting with the work of Bourgan, and then Tao and other people. 
this is the so-called critical case. And this case was completely open until a couple of years ago. So on one hand, when P is that large, it tells you that in principle, it does not, the energy does not, does not constrict the uh, self-similar blow-up. But because this problem is, it's, it's called the defocusing problem, because here the potential term helps you, helps you energy. If P becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, this term becomes stronger and stronger and stronger. So it was not, nat not unnatural to conjecture that in this case, all solutions should be global as well. And this was in fact the conjecture of Bourgain from 2000. So Bourgain conjectured that the, in this case, the unknown case, no singularity should develop. Okay. So the theorem So here's the theorem. So this is the theorem from 21, um, and it's uh, Merle, Raphael, Schaftel, me, says that when Let's say n is bigger than or equal to 5, and p is bigger than n plus 2 over n minus 2. There are some restrictions, so it's not that general, but there exist p's and n's such that singularities develop in finite time. Let me make a couple of comments. The first comment is going to look very strange because I'm going to tell you that the singularities are non self similar. So you might wonder why am I bringing this up in the context of this talk. Uh, the second thing is that I'm going to tell you that they're highly oscillatory. Maybe that's less relevant. And the last thing is that they have finite co-dimension. So I'm going to explain this in more detail, and I'm going to slightly comment on this. So what does it mean, finite co-dimension? It just means that this is not universal. So this type of singularities, they're not attractors of the neighboring behavior. Um, what they are is that if you start with initial data that generates the singularity, you can perturb this initial data among infinitely, except you can, you can basically look at the ball minus, finite, minus finitely many dimensions, and then it will go to the same singularity. But you have finitely many instabilities in your problem, okay? So it's not an attractor. So in particular, that explains one feature which happened in this conjecture, which I told you about. So Bourguin conjectured this, and there were numerics. And people in, when doing numerics, they couldn't see um, the singularities, or at least the picture was mixed. Someone was seeing something, but then there were numerics which suggested that there are no singularities. Well, one of the reasons for it is that it's highly oscillatory, so it's very difficult to catch by numerics, and it's also that it's finite co-dimension. So if you take your initial data, you have to fine tune it very, very carefully to catch the singularity development. Okay, but the more important thing that I want to talk about is this. So it's non self similar. However, it it's, was captured by looking for self-similar solutions. So, so the first thing is that when you look at this equation, I showed you the similarity transformation. You can write down the equation for self-similar solutions. And the point is that we don't know whether self-similar equation has solutions or not. So self-similar solutions not known. We just don't know whether we can, they exist or not. So what do you do in this case? How do you look for singularities? Well, the idea was, see, the basic premise here is that if you have a singularity, you want to say that it's approximated by a self-similar solution. And therefore, you want to look for self-similar solutions. 
what we did is that we replaced it by a different idea. We said, instead, let's approximate the whole PDE by a different PDE. And let's then look for self-similar solutions of that new PDE. So find self-similar solution. of a different PD. Well, again, this is a little too general. So let me show you specifically what one can do in this case. So what is that PD? It turns out to be Erler. At this point, you might, be, you might be wondering, because if I'm telling you that instead we found self-similar solutions of Euler and singularities of Euler, then you know, there might be a bigger theorem than the one that I've shown you. <laughs> but but, but what, what's important here is that there are actually two different kind of Euler equations. Um, one is called incompressible Euler, and the other one is called compressible Euler equation. So this is compressible. So what is the difference? Well, so in, in a nutshell, think of compressible Euler as describing evolution of gases. It's easy to compress gases, right? They change their volume under pressure. And then incompressible, you can think of a liquid, which, is, which does not change morally. So what's a compressible Euler equation? There are two unknowns, density of the gas and the velocity of the gas. Density is rho, velocity is u. So this is the equation which is a, it's a balance equation. So this tells you something about the flux of gas in the differential form. And there's a second equation which takes this form plus grad P is equal to zero. This is pressure. And for compressible uh, fluids, pressure is actually given to you. It's, it's called an equation of state. So in this case, gamma minus 2 over 2 gamma, rho to the power gamma. Okay. So this is so-called polytropic gases. OK, so rho density u velocity. What's the relation to Schrodinger? Well, first, let me introduce look at specific case of irrotational flow. In which case, velocity is simply assumed to be equal to the gradient of some function psi. This is called potential. So irrotational because the, the curl of u is equal to 0 if u is equal to the gradient of psi. If you plug this in, That's P. That's the only P. Yes, sorry. Um, if you plug this in, then the first equation is basically going to be the same. I'm just going to plug in this. And the second equation, well, the second equation can be transformed. Uh, maybe it's not immediately obvious, but if you think about it for 10 seconds, you realize that this is true. It becomes this equation. So I plugged in u equals gradient of psi, and then I took the whole gradient out. So this is the integrated form of the second equation. This is called Bernoulli equation. So because Bernoulli was the first one to realize that for irrotational flow, you can sort of integrate the second equation. OK. So that's just the equation equivalent form of the compressible earlier in the irrotational case. So let me connect it now to Schrodinger. And the connection is not difficult at all. So let's take our function phi here. So I'm going to do this on this side of the blackboard. And suggestively, 
I'm going to rewrite phi in the following form. I'm going to write it as square root of rho times e to the minus i psi. And I'm going to plug this into the equation. And remember that this equation is actually two equations, because I can look at the real and imaginary part. And what you will find, amazingly enough, is that up to numerical constants, um, well, I guess I can tell you exactly what these numerical constants are. So this is twice divergence of rho times gradient of c is equal to 0. And then the second equation is This is, a, this is an equation for any solution. As long as you can write your solution in this form, and this is basically writing the solution as the amplitude times the phase, then the phase and the amplitude will satisfy this equation. And you notice that up to numerical constants, which can be eliminated by rescalings, it's the same equation. So that sort of says that we should identify this with the density of the gas, and you should identify this with the potential of the gas. Yeah, sorry. Of course, P was the was this, and pressure was yeah. So this this P is related to this P. So in fact, in, in this case, you should identify P minus one over two as a result should be equal to gamma. That's the identification. So if you make this ident identifications, then you realize that you get this, except that almost true. I lied to you again, because there is, a, there is something on the right-hand side here, which is actually a pretty bad-looking term, but I'm going to explain what happens here. So it's a Laplace of square root of rho divided by square root of rho. If you forget this, then you see that that's exactly the same. And if it's there, then of course it's not exactly the same. That's why I said that we're going to try to approximate a PDE with a different PDE. The PDEs are not going to be exactly the same. They have to be approximated. So somehow one has to argue that this term is going to go to, is going to be low order when we go to the singularity. And it is a very scary looking term because if you count, let's say, in terms of the number of derivatives, this is actually the highest order derivative in your equation. So somehow I'm telling you that that's, that's good. That's the fact that it's, it loses derivatives, it's not relevant. This term is going to go to zero. OK. So um, I guess I should, I should wrap up, right? Yeah. OK. So, um, so let's assume that somehow this term will be manageable. What is the point here? The point here is that we approximated this, the PDE that we started with, approximated in quotes because of this term, by a different PDE, which is compressible earlier. OK, we talked about the, the similarity group for this equation, which was R plus. Now, it warrants to talk about the similarity group for this equation to see what it looks like. And this is where the amazing thing happens. The amazing thing is that the similarity group for this one was R plus. The similarity group here is bigger. It's r plus times r plus. So it's r plus times r plus. So when you look for self-similar solutions, you can write down a self-similar equation. But what you discover in that case is that there is a free parameter in your equation. Because the group, after you reduce by the action of r plus, you still have one, one parameter left. And this is what Zeldovich was talking about. He was talking about that in hydrodynamics, the PDEs, they only determine one parameter out of the possible two. When you start looking for self-similar solutions, you have an extra parameter to play with, so to speak. And what can happen in that case is that while for all values of that parameter, you may not be able to find self-similar solutions, they might be discrete family of, this va of the values of that parameter for which self-similar solutions do exist. 
And that's exactly what happens here, but with various caveats. But I guess that's going to be for next time. So the point, let me just make a summary. So the point of what's going to happen here is that we switch to a different PDE. In the process of the switching, we enlarge the similarity group. We doubled it. As a result, it gives us more freedom in terms of looking for self-similar solutions. Here, we don't know. We, don't, we cannot prove existence of self-similar solutions. Here, because of this extra parameter, we will be able to prove an existence of a self-similar solution for a discrete family of this values of this extra, uh, extra parameter. And then we're going to take this self-similar solution and we're going to insert this into this equation. And we're going to show that this term is actually low order when evaluated on the self-similar solution itself. Okay? Not generally, not for all solutions, but specifically on self-similar solutions. And as a result, the self-similar solution taken from here will be a good approximation for a solution of this PDE. Okay, and that's basically how this construction works. So I'll show you next time maybe a few more details about this, and I'll, then I'll switch to the sort of this other more geometric problem. Next lecture will be Tuesday at 12 p.m. Will it be on Zoom? Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yeah. Is there some quick heuristic for why would you think that term would be on a self similar solution would, would decay or, or be lower order? <laughs> so, no. The short answer is no. Uh, but in reality, it's the following. So this, the, the problem that we're considering here is called the supercritical, supercritical defocusing Schrodinger. Supercritical means that it's, the energy is not strong enough to control the nonlinearity. And okay, so that means sort of this, this comparison, supercriticality versus energy, refers to the native scaling of this problem. Okay, now. We're breaking the native scaling of this problem by switching to scaling of a related problem. And what happens is that the scaling here is such that uh, on supercritical solutions here, this term becomes less relevant. You see, if we, if we kept the scaling of the native problem, then this term would scale exactly the same way as everyone else. And so therefore, you could never say that this term is low order. But we broke that scaling. We went to this one. And relative to this scaling, the equation does not scale the same way. So if you actually look at how this equation scales under the scaling that is used here, this term picks up some small constant, which goes to zero under the scaling of that problem. So we basically destroying the scaling of the original problem. We rescaling the whole equation in, in such a way that different terms scale differently. And this term turns out to be scaling favorable. That's the idea, why this term is negligible. So generally, if you had any PDE with one uh, annoying element, <coughs> you multiply it by the scaling that goes to zero faster. Than well, generally, no, right? I mean, so you can't just multiply the the the, the equation by that. You, you you can't just multiply a term that you don't like by something which goes to zero. So this procedure is, is doing something else. This procedure is saying, look at the look at a different equation, find the, the scaling transformation for that equation, look at the solutions that preserve that, that, that obey that scaling transformation there, and then look at how this equation scales uh, when you put in those, those solutions in here. And it turns out that the different terms scale differently. Okay. <laughs> Those equations come from those optics, diagonal yes. linear optics, yes. and fluid. Does it reveal any connection? Yes, the and we're not, we're not the first one to observe this connection. So in the case of the linear problem, so when this is equal to 0, there is no nonlinearity. So this is just quantum mechanics. And in this case, this would be what's called so-called pressureless fluid. This connection so, uh, was observed by Madelung in 1920s. There's a German physicist who was trying to understand 
uh, foundations of quantum mechanics. And he wanted to interpret quantum mechanics as an equation for a fluid. And in that case, he wrote down exactly this, except he didn't have this term. And he identified this extra term here on the right-hand side, and he called it quantum pressure. So there is a formal correspondence between the fact that between the equations of quantum mechanics and the equations of fluid dynamics. The problem, however, is that that formal correspondence didn't go anywhere in the sense that, well, this is quantum pressure. You can, you can, you can think of it as pressure, but what do you do with this? So, but yes, this connection had been noticed before. People, people understood that. So let's thank Igor again.